you, everyone. I feel like I have to yell, good morning. I will now call the October quarterly meeting of the Board of Trustees of Illinois State University to order. For the record, I will note that Trustees Donahue and Rossmark are participating via conference call. In accordance with the general provisions of the Open Meetings Act, 5 ILCS 120, a member not physically present at the meeting and participating through other means needs to state the reason they are pre prevented from physically attending, such as one, physical personal illness or disability, uh, employment pur two, employment purposes, or three, family or other emergency. Trustee Donahue, Trustee Rossmark, please state the reasons you are prevented from attending following answering here when your name is read. Trustee Louderback, would you call the roll? Trustee Bone. Present. Trustee Dobsky. Present. Trustee Donahue. I'm, I'm here virtually, and it's due to employment reasons. Trustee Jones. Present. Trustee Lauterbach. Present. Trustee Navarro. Present. Trustee Rossmark. I'm here, and it's due to employment reasons. Trustee Turner. Here. Chairperson Jones, we have a quorum. Thank you, Trustee Lauterbach. Now, can I have a motion and a second to permit Trustees Donahue and Rossmark to join us via conference call to officially attend and participate in today's meeting? I so move. Second. I have a motion by Trustee Navarro and a second by Trustee Bone. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Trustees Donahue and Rossmark, you can now officially participate in today's meeting. You have before you the agenda for today's meeting. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Trustee Lauterbach and a second by Trustee Bone. All those in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The agenda is approved. You now have before you the minutes of, meet, of the meeting of July 24, 2020 quarterly meeting. August 12, 2020 special meeting, and September 12, 2020 special meeting of the Board of Trustees. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the July 24, 2020 special meeting? Make a motion. Second. second. We have a motion on the floor by Trustee Dobsky and a second by Trustee, Trustee Navarro. Do we have, um, I mean, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Can I have a motion and a second for the approval of the August 12th, 2020 special meeting? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Trustee Rossmark and a second by Trustee Louderback. Can I have um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the September 12, 2020 special meeting? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Trustee Dobsky and a second by Trustee Bone. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes of September 12, 2020 special meeting are approved. Next on the agenda is public comments. We have two individuals who indicated an interest in making public comments to the board today. In accordance with policy, the Board of Trustees will allow up to 30 minutes in total for public comments and questions during a public meeting. An individual speaker is permitted five minutes for his or her presentation. If more than, one per, uh, more than two persons wish to speak on a single item, it is recommended they choose one or more persons to speak for them. The Board of Trustee will, Trustees will accept copies 
of the speaker's presentations, questions, and other relevant written materials. If you have any written materials you want to share with the trustees, you may send them to bot at ilstu.edu. When appropriate, the Board of Trustees will provide a response to the speaker's questions within a reasonable amount of time. At this time, I invite Julia Renter to come to the podium and proceed with your comments to the board. I'm sorry, and I also have Nate Rarden. Are you guys presenting together? Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, good morning, Board of Trustees, and um, thank you for letting us speak to you today in order to express our concerns. I'm Julia Redder, and I'm a physics major here at Illinois State. And I am Nate Rarden, and I am a computer science major here at Illinois State. As you'll notice, we're gonna have to switch back and forth a little bit because of COVID protocols, but we'll get through. Anyway, we represent a group of over 200 people in our group chat and over 8,000 people that signed our petition. And this is a joint coalition of students, family members, and faculty that have concerns about the software of ProctorTrack. And so as a group of students um, with support from our faculty and parents, uh, we feel as if our right to privacy has been infringed. The implementation of ProctorTrack is an invasion of our personal privacy and the privacy of those around us, as well as being an inherently discriminatory method of monitoring academic dishonesty. We wish the administration to rethink their approach to proctoring exams, and we want to work together to find an alternative solution. So first, to understand our concerns about ProctorTrack, I'll give a brief synopsis of what ProctorTrack is and what it does for anyone who may not be aware. ProctorTrack offers automated online remote proctoring to institutions by monitoring student devices. This collects data such as names, government ID, phone numbers, email addresses, screen captures, 360 degree room scans, and AI data profiles on facial image and voice. As you can see, this is quite a lot of information to be held hostage just so we can take a math quiz. But we have more grievances than that. So now that we understand what ProctorTrack is, we can expound what raises our concerns about it, including faulty university notification, a lack of transparency, the compromising of student privacy and security, data collection and ownership, and unfair discrimination to students. So first, let's talk about the university's notification of buying the software. ProctorTrack was purchased by ISU on August 25th, 2020, according to a receipt that we obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. No one spends $100,000 without approval at least a few days beforehand, so we can safely assume that this decision was made about the time classes started. However, we were not notified of this decision until October 1st, nearly a month and a half later. This left students with barely a week to decide if compromising their system security is worth dropping a class and still getting a WX, since the deadlines for dropping a class without receiving the WX and dropping the class and still getting a refund had been passed by that point. In addition, in the notification about ProctorTrack was in the middle of the email where most students would likely miss it, and it had no mention of the increase of technology required or the increase of data collection by the software. COVID-19 has always already put a financial strain on students and this adds more. We acknowledge that the university is making known which course selections will be using ProctorTrack so that we can avoid it in the spring. And I speak for all of us when I say we will. But given course schedules, this isn't always possible to avoid, which forces students to decide between compromising their college career or compromising their personal security and their right to privacy. So not only did we not know that it was going to be implemented, we don't even know what exactly is going to be implemented still. Uh, we know that ISU has purchased level two of ProctorTrack, but when we go to the ProctorTrack website itself to see what exactly level two entails, we are first met with a very general and vague description of what level two is. And when we scroll down further, we are met with a list of features that ProctorTrack offers, the bottom 75% of which are blurred out so we can't even read them. And so we are uncomfortable with a program that refuses to disclose its full list of features, and we question why it wants to keep these features hidden. And we also question, why must it be so intrusive and invasive? And we would like to argue that this is a moral violation of our privacy. It has unreasonable access to both our computers and our phones. And so while 
um, Proctor Check claims to use none of this data um, in a malicious way. All we have is their word, and we have no evidence that they won't choose to use it in such a way. Um, this data includes like our 360 degree room scan, uh, root access to both of those devices, meaning that if you have things such as medical records, tax forms, or even other just personal and confidential uh, documentation and information, it has access to that as long as, as well as access to your network. Um, this also not only applies to our personal privacy, but the privacy of those around us as well, and those of whom we share living spaces with. Because if I do a 360 degree room scan, and I share a room with my roommate, not only does it see all of my possessions and everything that I do, it sees all of her possessions and everything that she's doing as well. It is also unreasonable for those students on campus who, um, maybe don't have a most reliable internet connection or want to respect the roommate's privacy, so if they choose to use a pr um, public space, um, anywhere outside a dorm room, you're required to wear a face mask, rendering the facial recognition software used by ProctorTrack um, just completely useless. And so we don't want to subject ourselves to this level of intrusion. So let's talk about data collection ownership by the software. As per ProctorTrack's own documentation, data that they collect is stored for two years. That's two years where data is at risk of being breached. And two days ago, they did have a data breach. As hackers were able to gain full access to the website and their entire email, uh, their entire email tree. Now, data could be used maliciously by ProctorTrack themselves as well. A similar service, Proctorio, had an issue where the CEO leaked private chat logs on the internet in order to win an argument with a student on Reddit. Furthermore, ProctorTrack themselves is no better, as they had an instance in July where a remote employee of ProctorTrack sent a Facebook friend request to a student that he had been proctoring. Not only should this not happen, it shouldn't even be possible to happen, and students should not be subjected to a situation where this is possible. Furthermore, ProctorTrack has this to say about data transfer. In the case of any merger, sale, acquisition, bankruptcy, liquidation, or other transfer of assets, including the company, any of your personal information, which remains on the company's servers at that time, may be transferred to and or managed by the acquiring company or entity. What this legalese means is that anyone who has enough money to purchase ProctorTrack has enough money to purchase all of ISU students' data. ProctorTrack also has the capacity to discriminate against its neurodivergent students. Those students that have ADHD, ADD, dyslexia, autism, or even OCD will be discriminated against by this software as it marks unorthodox eye movements, physical movements, and even your voice as a testing violation. So that means I could be flagged for doing something as simple as cracking my knuckles, looking at my ceiling to focus, or squeezing a stress ball while I work. And this goes beyond those disabilities as well. For example, if I'm using a calculator while I'm taking my math test or working out a physics problem on a piece of paper in front of me, it can also mark that as cheating. And so in an effort to combat academic dishonesty, you're ultimately combating standard test-taking behaviors. We recognize that ProctorTrack claims to be FERPA, ADA, and GDPR ready, but we can argue that no AI software can adequately and accurately monitor this unpredictable human behavior. We also recognize that while ProctorTrack doesn't directly affect our grade, um, it requires professors to go back and check each one of these flagged actions and verify whether or not it is in fact cheating. And so while this seems as a foolproof check to this system, it is unreasonable because some professors have 300 students in a lecture, and so it is unreasonable to expect them to go back and check every single one of these flagged actions, for there are going to be a lot of them, and change these grades accordingly. And it's not just students that have a problem with ProctorTrack, it's faculty members as well. We sent out anonymous surveys to a wide variety of faculty members and got these responses. One member said, using such technology in the classroom undermines the process of learning, assumes an adversarial role between instructor and students, and ultimately has long-term negative effects on the student's perception of learning. Another faculty member said, if these tools are being used in a limited capacity for specific accreditation requirements, then it should be limited to those instances by policy. Furthermore, someone said, overreaching surveillance of students that inherently positions them is distrustful and not good pedagogy. 
Another faculty member said, there is no reason to suspect students of committing infractions of academic integrity. This kind of program undermines the sacred trust between student and mentor. There are also far better pedagogical practices than a test program to reduce violations of academic integrity. Furthermore, what a way to create an inequitable learning environment and to stress out already stressed out students. And our last quote, online proctoring software using biometric data is 21st century phrenology and every bit is unreliable and discriminatory. So let's talk about alternative solutions. First of all, we could just have professors proctor through Zoom, which better approximates the in-class learning environment anyway, or have exams that are designed to allow outside resources, or such that outside resources aren't much help, which is arguably better test design in the first place. Furthermore, if you insist on using software, you could use a simple lockdown browser or require an ISU VPN connection throughout the duration of the test. While this would collect some data, it would only be during the duration of the test, and at least we know it's ISU that has it, not some third party company. And so it is for these reasons that the general student body of Illinois State University feels uncomfortable with the implementation of ProctorTrack in November. We believe not only that ProctorTrack is unfair, but more importantly, it is intrusive and an unnecessary infringement upon our moral right to privacy. And so we ask, why should students be required to blindly trust a third party corporation with our data? Why should the student body be expected to relinquish such a high level of privacy? Does ISU value academic honesty more than a student's basic right to privacy? Is ISU equipped to provide test taking means for us students who refuse to compromise our personal data? Were any of these alternatives considered? And if so, why were none of them used? And ProctorTrack has been hacked before. How can, it, how can we trust that it won't be hacked again? And so I would just like to say that we will email our presentation that we've been referencing along with our official um, declaration against this ProctorTrack software to the Board of Trustees following the meeting. And so I'd just like to thank you guys again for listening to our concerns um, and taking them into consideration. And of course, I would also like to thank you for listening to us and our concerns about the software. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Rudder. Thank you, Mr. Rodden. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this October 16, 2020 quarterly meeting of the Board of Trustees. And reflecting on my remarks for today's meeting, I couldn't ignore how different things are today in October of 2020 from our previous October quarterly meetings. Normally, October on this campus is a time of celebration and high activity. We celebrate the accomplishments of former athletes and alums during homecoming activities, we ride in a parade, we cheer on our Redbirds, hopefully to a football victory, volleyball, soccer, cross country teams, all in their competitions. We enjoy performances by our students in music, theater, and dance programs. And we enjoy fellowship with our students, faculty, staff, alums, and friends of the university. Today, we all notice a, a missing of all of those activities, not just on campus, but our lives have just changed fundamentally from where they were October 2019. We know the students, the faculty, the staff, the alums, all of us are feeling the stress of living our lives during this pandemic. And we're feeling the, the stress of dealing with uh, just an atmosphere of social change. I believe I can speak for most of us when we say that this is a challenge and they were all trying to do the best that we can every day to deal with data and information and circumstances that change not just on a daily basis but sometimes it feels like on an hourly basis. This is a time where I think that all of us need to exhibit patience with each other, compassion with each other and even though we can't hug and you guys know I'm a hugger, um, a little bit of extra love and compassion toward each other. I believe that I speak for all of us when we say that we're doing the best we can and that we all are hopeful that better days are on the horizon. We can say, and we are excited and thinking about when we can once again safely return to some of those activities that we love so much and make Illinois State so dear to us. As an election is just around the corner, I wanna encourage everybody to get out and vote. As a democracy, it's everyone's right to vote and we should take that very, very seriously. Regardless of your political affiliation and your, vote, uh, your affiliation, please, 
please get out and vote. I will now turn my, t my comments over to President Dietz for his remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson Jones. I appreciate the reminiscence of uh, last fall and look forward to a return of those whenever it's safe. And I would mention uh, that we are planning a homecoming in the spring. It will be the first spring homecoming I think I've ever attended in my whole career, but we're looking forward to that and appreciate your comments. I want to begin my comments today by sharing something that is a little more philosophical than uh, my typical comments at a Board of Trustee meeting. I want to read a quote and then I'll uh, put the quote in context. The quote is, I see the arrival of more difficult times for many institutions of higher education. These difficulties are likely to emerge to different degrees in different types of institutions. I expect fellow presidents will have a less relaxed decade than in the past 10 years. Presidents will be even more conscious of the harsh fact that grievances accumulate faster, perhaps against presidents in periods of conflicts. History will reflect a time of social tensions in our society and economic crises, and our institutions are likely to be heavily involved in these tensions and crises. I say this as one who over the years has been a great optimist about the future of higher education. I've paraphrased the words of Clark Kerr, who was president emeritus and emeritus professor of economics at the University of California. Dr. Kerr was a prolific and well-respected author on higher education during that time. His words, the ones that I just uh, read, appeared in a book that he authored entitled Trouble Times for American Higher Education. That book was authored in 1994. And I bring that up simply because that there, uh, he was writing about troubled times in the 90s during that time frame. I bring that up simply to say that history sometimes repeats itself in different kinds of ways. We obviously are beyond the 90s and we'll get beyond 2020 and, uh, and move along. But uh, that was 26 years ago. And I wanted to read that to kind of put it into context to some of the challenges that we face now. We're up for those challenges. We will move ahead. And uh, perhaps, uh, you know, 26 years hence, we'll be able to reflect back on 2020 the way I have on uh, the 1994 publication. I appreciate uh, Chair uh, Jones's comments about voting. As you know, one of our core values is civic engagement at the university. And I would go a bit further than Chairperson Jones and say that if you poll the value of civic engagement, then I would suggest that you might have an obligation to vote. In honor of uh, National Voter Registration Day, Illinois State University, Illinois Wesleyan University, and Heartland Community College are facing off against each other in a very friendly competition to increase voter engagement across the three campuses. The uh, Blono Campus Voter Registration Challenge kicked off on September the 22nd, uh, National Voter Registration Day, and the challenge aims to see uh, which institution can get the most students to register to vote. Voter registration ac across the U.S. runs until October the 18th, so we still have uh, a few days to register if you have not already. And I also want to uh, commend our student body president, Lauren Harris, who's in the audience today for uh, her leadership and and uh, also Jada Turner and uh, Trustee Turner and her leadership for emphasizing to students how important it is to register to vote and get out and vote. Early voting will be held in the Bone Student Center from October the 26th to the 30th. On election day, November the 3rd, the university will be closed in compliance with the governor's declaration that state offices, agencies, and universities be closed on election day. There are two uh, precinct locations on campus this year where you can vote on election day, the Bone Student Center in Watterson Commons. On another note, earlier this month, Larry Lyons announced that he is retiring near the end of the calendar year after 33 years in athletics at Illinois State. Uh, his creative talents in finance, facilities, and administrative leadership have enhanced opportunities for Illinois State student athletes to achieve their goals and reach for their dreams. Under Larry's leadership, our student athletes really are truly student athletes. They have uh, accomplished a great deal in the classroom and also in the fields of competition. He's hired coaches who believe in the student-athlete model, and our record of NCAA competition has been stellar. So congratulations, Larry. 
Uh, we are proceeding with a national search for a new athletic director and hope to have someone in place in January. We are using the services of Whit Kiefer uh, to assist us with that search. Uh, they were the national executive search firm with experience in higher education and athletics that most recently assisted the university with the provost search, and that was successfully completed with the hiring of Provost Tarhuli. Uh, Brent Beggs, professor and chair of the School of Kinesiology and Recreation, and also former chair of the Athletic Council, will serve as the chair of the search committee. The committee has wide representation, including faculty, staff, and students representing uh, the divisions of academic affairs, finance and planning, student affairs, and university advancement, the Athletic Council, the Student Athlete Advisory Committee, Department of Athletics Administrators and Head Coaches, and the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Council. On another note, on Monday, we hosted uh, legislators, including Congressman uh, Rodney Davis and, uh, and um, uh, also Congressman uh, LaHood and State Senators Bill Brady and, and the Senator, State Senator uh, Jason Berrigman at the ISU Farm in Lexington for a briefing on Pennycrest. Senators uh, Durbin and uh, Duckworth uh, sent their regrets. They had planned on being there for that uh, event as well, but uh, the purpose of the event is that per uh, Professor John Sedbrook was explaining how a $13 million grant from the Department of Energy is funding his research on turning a weed doing, uh, known as pennycrest into biofuel. Uh, bio, uh, uh, that's a complex process. I learned a lot about that and the people that were attending that uh, re were representing the airline industry and lots of other uh, businesses across uh, the country. And uh, they're focused right here on Illinois and right here on Illinois State in providing information about how, to, how that, uh, that process occurs. Then on Tuesday, I traveled to Chicago to take part in the announcement by uh, Janice Jackson, CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, and Chicago Mayor Lightfoot of a new program entitled Teach Chicago Tomorrow to help Chicago public schools develop more homegrown teachers. Students in the program would earn an associate degree at City Colleges of, of Chicago and then receive their bachelor's degree in education at ISU through the university's National Center for Urban Education. Um, uh, the, those offices in Chicago and, and also online. So it allows those students really never to leave Chicago. And it's a two plus two plus one program where the first two are at the city colleges. The second two would be with us online there and also in person there. And the other one would be one full year of student teaching that would be paid student teaching in Chicago. One of the presenters at the announcement was uh, Chicago public school teacher Daniel Jackson. Daniel is an ISU graduate who returned to his native South Side where he teaches second graders at Dixon Elementary. It was a special pleasure for me to be on the same stage as Daniel. You see, he and I knew each other all four years of his college uh, education here. He was a very active student, very engaged young man, and uh, when he was a student at, here at ISU, and we're most proud of him and his accomplishments, and indeed, he's the poster person for that kind of a program. So. The uh, goal is to start a pilot with 100 students in it and move up to uh, 500 students uh, in, in a relatively short period of time. Dean Jim, uh, Jim Wolfinger, our Dean of the College of Education, and his team have really been instrumental in putting that program together. Last week, members of Cabinet and a few other administrators met with the leadership of the Illinois Board of Higher Education for what was uh, typically been referred to as the big picture meeting. IBHE is meeting with all the public universities in the state during this month. The meeting had three themes. The statewide strategic plan for higher education that IBHE is developing, equity in terms of enrollment, retention, and graduate, uh, graduation rates, and the FY 2022 budget. Illinois State is committed to equity and is continuing to evaluate efforts and develop new initiatives to narrow the gap in terms of student retention and graduation rates. In a few moments, I will share with you the university's request for the FY 2022 budget. It, it is a modest request, in part because of all the, all of us understand the ec economic impact the, the pandemic has had on state revenues. IBHE advised us to uh, develop for a potential 5 and 10% budget reduction scenario for FY 2022. I reminded the uh, IBHE executive director and staff that such a budget reduction, either at the 5 or the 10 percent 
rate would unfairly affect Illinois State as the university receives the lowest funding per student of any public institution. Board members know that, the group in this room knows that, uh, but we simply need to do something about that. Uh, the next uh, institution that receives the next lowest is the University of Illinois, and uh, we received nearly half of what they received. So uh, we hope that there'll be some consideration for that as the FY 2022 budget is, uh, is prepared for the, uh, by IBHE for all, all institutions. I'm very proud to report the significant drop in the seven-day positivity rate for COVID-19 since we last met with the Board of Trustees. The seven-day positivity rate is at 2.4% today. I want to thank our students for behaving responsibly in the week since we saw a peak in cases, but I also want to remind them and everyone else to continue to be safe by wearing a mask, washing your hands frequently, avoiding large gatherings, limiting your exposure, and getting a COVID-19 test regularly. Uh, we cannot fool ourselves. It's a serious pandemic. We're still at it. The numbers are increasing across the state and indeed across the nation. And a number of uh, coronavirus cases continues uh, to uh, uh, increase in that regards, and we uh, want to do the right thing and be responsible. So I also want to command uh, or com remind students uh, to uh, get their flu shots. Um, it's especially important to have a flu shot this year. Uh, flu shots are offered free of charge for students through the uh, student health services. Uh, I received mine a, a week or so ago in this very room, and so uh, we're not planning to bring that group back in here this morning, but nevertheless, the uh, flu shots are available. I know many students, parents, and faculty and staff are anxious to know about the spring semester. We continue our planning based upon the latest information available. The experts tell us that in January that we will be battling the normal flu season and COVID-19 and vaccinations for the virus will not be widely available yet. Thus, the spring semester at Illinois State will look much like the fall semester with many classes being taught online and limited in-person classes. The residence halls will be open for those who are eligible and want to reside on campus. And we're looking at how we can help students engage with each other while remaining safe with programs and activities in small groups. The spring will be a busy athletic season if all goes as planned with uh, fall, winter, and spring sports all occurring during the spring semester. It's not clear yet whether we will have fans in the stands for athletic events, and if we do, attendance, we're pretty sure will be limited. I also want to share with uh, you today the a name change for a unit in a facility. While well, the Board of Trustees approves the naming of a, of a facility or unit that is named in honor or memory of a person or persons, a corporation or other entity, uh, university policy indicates that uh, uh, the president may approve functional names of units and facilities. Upon the recommendation of the University Naming Committee, uh, I approved this last week, changing the name of the Center for Community Engagement and Service Learning to simply the Center for Civic Engagement to be more uh, descriptive. Many people uh, already refer to CESL as the Center for Civic Engagement, and it's more descriptive of trends that are happening nationally, and so we have made that, that, uh, that one-time change. Uh, I would like to uh, encourage folks, if you would like to have the Center for Civic Engagement named after you, we're still accepting donations to do that, and Pat Vickerman is in the room, and he'd be happy to talk with you after this meeting if you want to do that, or if you know other people that might want to do that, but that's been a functional uh, name change. Uh, I will now turn to the campus communications report and would like to call on the spokesperson for the campus communications committee, Elizabeth Chupp, for a report. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of the campus communication committee, representing Academic Senate, AP Council, Civil Service Council, and the Student Government Association, We'd like to begin by acknowledging the hard work and dedication of many members of the ISU community as our campus continues to cope with the unprecedented challenges that come with the COVID-19 pandemic. First, we'd like to offer our thanks and support to the administration and the members of the COVID-19 working groups as they continue to make plans and implement solutions to support the health and safety of our campus community while maintaining the rigor of our academic programs, the structure of our student support systems, and the overall student experience. 
We appreciate the increased involvement of shared governance groups in the decision-making process and the improvements to regular communication to the campus. We remain eager to hear more updates regarding COVID testing on campus. As part of the testing plans, we urge the administration to develop clear standards and guidelines for testing and provide consistent messaging to the campus community regarding expectations and requirements. We're thankful for faculty across campus who worked tirelessly this summer to prepare online courses to engage students in the learning process. Our faculty devoted thousands of hours of professional development time this summer to learn new technologies and develop online pedagogy, most working off contract to do so. This demonstrates their dedication and commitment to teaching and learning at ISU. We're grateful to the staff at the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology for their continued support and guidance to faculty in their transition to online instruction. While most faculty long to be back in the classroom, they are rising to the challenge and working with their chairs and directors to choose safe environments in which to pursue the learning objectives for their students. Both faculty and staff continue to work hard to coach students through the challenges and opportunities of synchronous and asynchronous learning environments. We are proud that our dedicated faculty, known for their individualized attention, are there to support student success from their virtual classrooms. We'd also like to thank the many staff members across campus who continue to support students in various capacities. Thank you to Dr. Doris Houston and her advisory council who continue to, to move diversity and inclusion initiatives to the forefront of our campus. We appreciate the steps that have been taken so far to encourage collaboration and enact change. And we recognize that there is still much more to do to enact lasting change. Thank you to Technology Solutions, who have tirelessly supported the technology needs across campus to facilitate successful learning and work environments. Thank you to academic advisors who continue to help students navigate course modalities and direct them to resources for success. Thank you to our University Housing Services team who has continued to provide frontline services to ensure the safety and success of our residential communities. Thank you to our facility staff for the countless hours you spend keeping our grounds and buildings safe. And thank you to the many other staff members for your contributions to campus and for supporting our students. Amidst the pandemic, we remain forward thinking and focused on a positive future at ISU. Albert Einstein noted, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And as we continue to evolve and reflect during this crisis, we believe we can turn unexpected events into opportunities. As we become more proficient with online courses and technology, perhaps there are possibilities to boost our enrollment through creative course offerings. The door opens for us to explore new programs to appeal to diverse student populations, create pathways and certificates, and utilize technology to enhance recruitment efforts for domestic and international students alike. When we begin to plan for a return to in-person courses, there will be an opportunity to explore how we might enhance our traditional services with technological advancement, providing further flexibility, ease, and reach. All of these ideas and more could have positive implications on our overall recruitment and retention initiatives at ISU. As higher education evolves through this crisis, Let's continue to think creatively and focus on turning unexpected costs into investments in order to offer higher excellence in higher education to students while maintaining the high quality of face-to-face -face instruction that ISU has been known for. This crisis also allows us to rethink the ways we conduct business across all areas of the university. Many of our staff members continue to excel while working virtually. 
Given the economic fallout that we are seeing here and around the country, we are thankful for the flexibility to work virtually during this unprecedented time, and we hope to see similar flexibility extend into the spring semester. We believe an opportunity exists to examine into the future and beyond the pandemic flexible work options for eligible employees, which could increase our competitive hiring position and give us the ability to pivot in any crisis. While many staff are enjoying the flexibility of a virtual work environment, maintaining work-life balance continues to be a struggle and a focus on mental health has become increasingly important for employees as well as students. Many employees are working around the clock to get the job done and overtime hours are disproportionately impacting some employees both staff and faculty. As we explore flexible work options, developing guidelines for work-life balance and mental health considerations will be an important part of future planning. As we look to the future, we're optimistic about the plans for the new engineering programs as well. We're grateful for the opportunity to participate in the open forums and provide feedback on the direction of these proposed new programs. However, where there is opportunity, there are also challenges. For example, our colleagues in the SERS self-managed plans continue to experience anxiety and concerns about their retirement benefits. During the time period to make changes in early September, many employees were unable to access their accounts, received inconsistent and inaccurate instructions, and did not receive additional information requ requested from SERS to make informed decisions. For these employees, clarity and flexibility is important to allow them to plan for a secure retirement, particularly in a context where they will not receive federal Social Security or will receive a greatly reduced federal benefit. We also recognize the financial pitfalls this crisis has created for our institution and we are grateful to our leaders who have spent long hours dealing with impossible problems that seemingly have no good solutions. We realize this will continue to be a challenge and we offer our support to you during this time. While 2020 continues to be a turbulent year, we're grateful that ISU remains strong and stable. With our core values to guide us, we continue to maintain a positive attitude and a hopeful eye on the future. Thank you and go Redbirds. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, since the uh, legislature is not in session, uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan uh, Lackland is here today, but uh, uh, had not planned on him providing a verbal report, but there is a written report, a brief written report in your, um, re, uh, in your folders this morning. So with that, uh, I want to close my general remarks and want to emphasize that our plans for the remainder of the academic year remain fluid. Adjustments will continue to be made as situations dictate, and we will continue to seek input from the leaders of our shared governance groups and the university community, community and we will communicate these plans and adjustments in a timely way. It will take the concerted efforts of the entire university community working together to overcome the challenges that we undoubtedly will continue to face this year. We need to be flexible and support each other in our efforts to provide our students with the quality education that they deserve. This morning I have three reports and seven resolutions uh, to uh, present this morning and Trustee Jones with your approval I will move to the first report. Uh, Dr. Deese please proceed. Thank you. First report is report uh, number 2020-10-4000.02 academic plan 2020 to 2025. The Illinois State University Constitution confers on the provost of the university the responsibility for compiling an academic plan that charts the directions for academic programs and initiatives of the university. The Constitution also directs the provost to assist and encourage academic units in developing more specific academic plans of their own. The Constitution further provides for faculty involvement in establishing and disestablishing academic programs and for periodic review by faculty of all academic programs to ensure their effectiveness and their viability. Annual reporting to the Board of Trustees regarding academic program changes and results of program 
reviews as, provi as provided for in the governing document of the Board of Trustees. Academic Plan 2025, which follows the executive summary, is presented to the Board of Trustees by the Provost in compliance with the aforementioned provisions of Illinois State University Constitution and Governing Document of the Board of Trustees. Ac Academic Plan 2025, 20 to 2025, includes a brief profile of the university, university strategic plan, an inventory of academic programs at the university and academic program changes approval since June 30 of 2019, an inventory of academic programs and units at the university recognized by specialized accreditation associations, an update regarding academic initiatives, college strategic plans and fiscal 2020 objectives, summaries of academic uh, program reviews conducted in fiscal year 2020, and a tentative schedule of academic program reviews from fiscal 2021 through fiscal 2028. If there are any questions uh, uh, about the plan, I would say, first of all, Dr. Tarhuli only joined us in July 1st, and wow, what a great job in just a few months on this, <laughs> Provost Tarhuli, but he obviously has a terrific staff that's been working on this for a long period of time, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer, or more likely refer them to Dr. Tarhuli or one of his staff. So with that, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them before I go on to my next report. Very good, thank you. Uh, the next report is uh, report number 2020, 10-4000.03, promotion, tenure, and sabbatical leave report. The report on promotion, tenure, and sabbatical decisions that take effect in FY 2021 is among the materials re you received in your packets. The report outlines the application review process for those decisions. Also provided in the report are summary data on this year's applications, rank distribution of the past decade for tenured faculty, and lists of the FY 2021 changes in status. Faculty seeking tenure and promotions go through a very rigorous evaluation progress that begins with submitting documentation of their teaching, research, and service to their de uh, department uh, or school faculty status committee, and their, uh, also their college faculty status committee uh, guidelines. The college dean and the provost also evaluate the faculty promotion and tenure materials. Recommendations to deny a promotion application can be appealed to the faculty review committee. All recommendations are forwarded to the president for consideration. Sabbaticals are professional development opportunities available to faculty to complete a proposed project. Uh, during the sabbatical, faculty are reassigned from uh, their other professional responsibilities. University requirements for sabbaticals limit the number of awards to one out of every 25 full-time tenure and tenure track and continuing administrative professional employees. Eligible staff must have five or more years of full-time service and are limited to no more than one sabbatical leave in every seven years. The number of promotions, tenure, and sabbaticals awarded have remained consistent over the years. Again, if there are any questions, I'd be uh, happy to try to take those, and either uh, Provost or Hooley, one of his staff or I would be happy to uh, try to answer those. Uh, and if not, I can, I'll move on to the next uh, report. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the next report is report number 2020, 10-1100.01, Educate, Connect, Elevate Annual Report. I'm very pleased to present the FY20 Educate, Connect, Elevate Illinois State Annual Report. This report highlights Illinois State University's accomplishments in the second year of the implementation of the strategic plan. The achievements highlighted in the report reflect the core values of the university and a clear vision to excel by enhancing strength and stability, fostering innovation, nurturing diversity and inclusion, and enriching engagement. While the pandemic definitely affected progress in many areas, the university has accomplished much in a very challenging year. I fully expect that progress uh, toward our goals will be affected by the pandemic again this next year. But I pledge to you that we will re maintain our focus on our core values and accomplish what we reasonably can do during this very unusual year. Again, if there are any questions, I'd uh, try to answer those or bring other staff av available to you if you do have questions. If not, I will uh, move on to the uh, resolutions if I 
have the permission of the chair to do so. I figure next year we'll do a lot better. Yes, yeah. <laughs> on a lot of fronts. It's been very challenging. Kind of hard to, yeah. Very challenging. You can proceed, Dr. On the resolutions, thank you. Uh, first resolution is resolution number 2020. 10-28 FY 2021 operating budget, the current year operating budget. In accordance with the Illinois Board of Higher Education policy, each public university governing board is to review and approve an official budget for the university it governs uh, each fall. Table one in your packet presents projected and actual revenues for FY 2020 by fund source and the proposed FY 2021 operating budget. FY 2021, unrestricted funds are budgeted to increase 2.8%. This uh, includes an appropriation from the state of Illinois of $69.1 million, which is flat from the FY 2020 appropriation. Let me emphasize that that is a big deal. We appreciate very much all the elected officials in the General Assembly and the uh, governor for allowing us to continue, A, to have a budget, We've been through years when we haven't had a budget, and having one is better than not having one. So we're very appreciative of that. And having a flat budget has helped us navigate through some very difficult times when the state is also going through difficult times. So we're very appreciative uh, of having a flat budget. Having said that, the state appropriation is 14% uh, uh, of the university's total operating budget. Uh, when I was a student, uh, many, many years ago uh, in the state of Illinois, uh, that percentage of the university's budget was uh, in the 80% range. So we've had a terrific uh, downturn of that, but having a flat budget for the current year is much appreciated. The general income fund, which is mostly tuition dollars, is a 3.7% uh, increase for FY 2021. And the university expects to spend $201.2 million in FY 2021 on the activities associated with its core functions of instruction, research and public service, representing 41.3% of the estimated total university expenditures. Most of these funds, $152.2 million, are derived from general revenue appropriations or university income fund. Another $24.4 million is expected to be spent on those activities that provide direct support to those core functions. Of the $62.4 million estimated to be spent on operations and maintenance, over $10 million is budgeted for utilities, electricity, gas, sewer water, et cetera, and utility conservation projects. Deferred maintenance of facilities will continue to be addressed as funds allow, and the university's accumulated backlog of maintenance required to bring all campus facilities up to top working condition is estimated at $410 million with $255 million needed for state-supported facilities and $155 million for bond revenue facilities. The university continues to allocate the resources to its highest priorities, and we continue to be good stewards of the funds that we have received. And with that, I ask for your approval of this resolution. Do I have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2020-10-28 operating budget? So moved. I'll second. We have a motion by Trustee Lauterbach and a second by Trustee Navarro. Do we have any questions or comments regarding this from the trustees? Just some questions. My, uh, Trustee Lauterbach, you can proceed. My iPad's not working right now, so I can't really see the charts. Is, have we already done Can you done use the, the microphone, Trustee Lauterbach? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> have we already done the 5% cut that we've been asked to do by the governor for the next, uh, for this fiscal year? No, no, that uh, only relates to FY 2022. And it's only a, a budget cut scenario, and it's been 5 and 10 percent. State okay. agencies have been asked for the current no, year. No, we w I mean, it's going to trickle down. So, I mean, do we have an idea? I mean, how will that affect us as far as uh, the, it, it the 5 won't and 10? It won't affect the current year. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any additional questions? Oh, Trustee, Trustee Turner. <laughs> um, with the 3% increase coming from tuition, would that mean tuition be going up? That's really a FY 2022 issue, and uh, the current uh, tuition is already set for the year. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? 
motion, uh, the resolution is approved. Thank you very much. Next resolution uh, gets into the FY 2022, and it's resolution number 2020.10-29, FY 22 appropriated budget requests operating in capital. Each year at this time, the university is re required to ask the board to approve its appropriated funds operating budget request and its capital appropriations request to the Illinois Board of Higher Education for the next fiscal year. State appropriated dollars provide the critical and irreplaceable core of support for delivery of high quality instructional programs and educational services to students. Maintaining strong and stable funding lessens the reliance on the university income fund, which is realized primarily from student tuition and fee payments, therefore helping to maintain the affordability of a college degree. The university continues to implement cost saving measures to redirect resources to high priority needs. For example, substantial funds are committed to financial aid in order to attract and retain students have little, who have little or no resources to pay for college costs. As we await capital and deferred maintenance funding, scarce operating resources have also been redirected to, addre to address repair and maintenance of campus facilities. During this time of substantial budget strain, the university maintains pride that its instructional programs continue to be recognized both nationally and internationally for their quality and their value. Due to the pandemic, state revenues have decreased and the governor has asked state agencies to take a 5% cut in the current year and prepare for a 10% cut in FY 2022. The clarification here is that universities are technically not state agencies. So you've seen a lot of reporting on state agencies uh, being asked to do that. But for FY 2022, in this uh, current time, uh, we're also being asked to plan for a, a potential 5 and 10% budget reduction scenario, though that information just came to us uh, relatively recently. After carefully uh, considering this, we have decided to request a flat appropriation, except for funds to reimburse the university for COVID-19 expenses incurred in FY 2021. This request represents a 15.8% increase or roughly $11 million over the university's prior year appropriation and is focused solely on uh, receiving state support to help reimburse the university for COVID-19 expenditures, specifically targeted to ensure the health and safety of our current students, faculty, and staff, along with additional IT instructional software and hardware support to quickly transition the university to offer the majority of its courses in a hybrid or online teaching environment. Excluding the request of funds needed to cover COVID-19 uh, expenditures, this FY 2022 budget represents a 0% increase to the FY 2021 funding level, which was $69.6 .6 million. The capital projects for which funding is requested for FY 2022 are instrumental in addressing the goals and priorities articulated in the university's strategic plan, educate, connect, and elevate, as well as the recommendations and master plan um, uh, project uh, 2010 to 2030, uh, looking to the future. These projects are important to enhancing a healthy, safe, and environmentally sustainable campus and to ensuring that the university has uh, physical infrastructure necessary for excellence in instruction, research, and service in the 21st century. Identifying the projects included in the annual request to the state for capital improvement funding involves an ongoing process of assessing academic and support service capital needs, determining facility use strategies, analyzing facilities conditions and opportunities, and evaluating available resources. The major projects included in the FY 2022 request and the priority assigned to them are reviewed and approved by the university's capital planning and budget team comprised of individuals from each division of the institution, shared governance constituencies, and intercollegiate athletics. University's request for state funds for capital improvements for FY 2022, totaling $449.6 million, including $409.2 million for six major capital improvement projects. The new engineering building, new Mennonite College of Nursing building, Thomas Metcalf School replacement, DeGarmo Hall rehabilitation, University High School replacement, and Williams Hall renovation. And in addition, the university requested $40.4 million for capital reserve projects. Uh, all of this is in line with the information that you received at the board meeting in September, and I ask for your approval of this resolution. 
Thank you, Dr. Deeds. Do I have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2020 10-29, appropriated budget, re budget request operating in capital? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Trustee Lauterbach and a second by Trustee Bone. Are there any questions or comments or concerns from the Board of Trustees? Yeah, Chairman uh, uh, Jones. Uh, uh, Regarding our percentage increase in that, and I know we use our own numbers and, and percentages in that, but how do we line up like with the other state universities as far as increase in that? Are we kind of in the, in the average ballpark as far as increases in that, or is anything being compared? There have been times when uh, uh, the Illinois Board of Higher Education has suggested that all the public universities come in within a range or, or basically within the same idea of a percentage increase uh, overall. Uh, that rarely has occurred, even though it's been encouraged by IBHE. I would say that uh, our request has always been a, a realistic request, uh, but there is no consistency across uh, all the institutions about the percentage increase. I think ours is realistic, given that, uh, you know, the state appropriations uh, have been where they have been and where the state revenues are, are where they are. Uh, I think it's realistic uh, not to expect uh, uh, a lot more. We would like to be reimbursed for our uh, COVID-19 expenses. Uh, we are testing uh, more than most other institutions are in the state, with the exception of the University of Illinois, and we're receiving no reimbursement for that at this at this point. I think testing is the right thing to do, but uh, it's an expensive process to go through, and we would simply like to see some some state support for that. It may very well be that at some point in time that we have. Uh, some federal, uh, extra federal stimulus money coming in that might help us with that too, but that's being debated and probably we're not gonna know about that until well after the election. So uh, right now I think uh, you know, the request that's out there is a reasonable one, uh, only with the exception of the percentages look high because of COVID-19. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments from the board? Um, Chairman, or Madam Chairman, this is Trustee Donahue. May I ask a question, please? Uh, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, President Deans, thank you for the report. And I don't want to put words into Trustee Dobsky's where his thought pattern were. I think my question was along his same lines. I know a couple of years ago, we were the least funded university on a, my term, a per capita basis, a per student basis. Is that still, um, the percentage take away the COVID expenses, but just purely from uh, what we received from the state. And, and it, again, I don't want to speak for anyone else but myself, but I would always characterize this as we were being penalized for doing a good job while our, our enrollment would either increase or, or be very stable. Our funding didn't reflect that. So has anything really changed with that, I guess, is my question. Uh, thanks uh, for the question, uh, Trustee Donahue. The, the, the answer is that no, uh, not much has changed on that. We're still in the basement in terms of the amount of money that we receive from the state on a per capita basis. We continue to push that agenda item. There is new leadership within the Illinois Board of Higher Education, the new executive director, Ginger Ostro, and I've had long conversations about that, as have uh, the uh, chair of the Illinois Board of Higher Education, John Atkinson. Uh, since they're new to their roles, they were unaware of the uh, disparity on the per student uh, appropriation and I've uh, indicated to her as we talk about some other priorities of the uh, uh, IBHE uh, mainly around the uh, the equity uh, issue uh, between um, uh, underrepresented students and the uh, uh, majority students on the campus that if in fact we were just brought up to where uh, uh, the other institutions uh, were even on the, the next lowest institution of uh, the University of Illinois, that would nearly double our appropriation. I think actually it would be an additional roughly $45 million. And I said, think of what we could do to help narrow that gap on the equity issue on retention. And so I am making the, those, uh, and then Jonathan Lacklin, our Director of Government Relations, has continued to beat that drum also with elected officials. So. We're still where we are. We have a bit of a new audience with some uh, new board members with IBHE. And uh, I've also uh, had an occasion that has been a while back, but also to speak to the governor about that. So we continue to bang on that. But uh, I would agree that, unfortunately, we're, 
uh, doing all the right things in my estimation as an institution uh, to uh, you know be uh, not only good stewards of the state dollars but uh, you know if you read our, our points of pride we're knocking it out of the park on most of the measures that most uh, people would think are uh, really terrific measures to evaluate an institution by in, uh, in terms of performance but uh, receiving the least amount per student is uh, uh, not a great incentive. So if we were able to move that up, we could do a lot more for uh, for the in entire institution. So your point is well taken. I agree, Dr. Dietz, and, and thank you. And um, we need to say thanks more often to you and, and the entire staff for, for doing, quite honestly, more with less. And, and hopefully one day the state recognizes that. So thank you for your leadership in that as well. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, next resolution is resolution number 2020.10-30, uh, Connect Transit Contract Extension. Uh, here we are again. <laughs> uh, we <laughs> We've had a number of extensions, and I uh, will be asking for your approval of this, of this one as well. Uh, negotiations on a new agreement are in progress, but are not anticipated to be settled by the expiration date of the current extension, which is December 31st of 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, along with the recent departure of Connect Transit's general manager, uh, who is the individual that's really responsible for final negotiation and execution of major contracts. The requested extension is representing a zero increase over the current contract terms, but it will have a monthly payment of $48,178 for the period of January 1 of 2021 through June 30th of 2021. The total funding requested over this six-month extension is projects is not to exceed $289,068. And uh, I ask for your approval uh, for this resolution in hopes that we'll have a new person to negotiate with and be successful for a longer term contract the next time. Do we have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2020-10-30, Connect Transit Contract Extension? So moved. I'm sorry, who? So moved. I'll second it. Uh, we have a motion on the floor by Trustee Lauterbach and a second by Trustee Dobsky. Are there any questions or concerns regarding this resolution from the board? Yes, uh, Chairman. Uh, I, to my understanding, is the uh, uh, Connect Transit still not charging any people draw, riding the bus right now till the end of the year or something? I'm going to ask uh, Vice President Stevens to come to the podium and answer that. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, actually, there is a fair. Um, uh, uh, delay uh, if I may I think it's through November 9th approved by their by their board so they have been operating essentially since last March without charging any fares across what's called the you know university acts uh, campus university access do we have any numbers about what usage has been like for connect transit since we've been going through this COVID situation from our campus community Unfortunately, um, what we have is anecdotal because from a safety perspective, um, if you pre-COVID, we were doing you know, almost 2,500 per day, almost 620,000 overall, especially through our Redbird Express. That was done uh, by a card swipe. Well, because of the COVID environment, they're now asking students and any riders across the, across the Bloomington normal area to actually enter the bus in the back and not swipe and so um, they haven't been tracking that but they generally have been telling our teams it's being anywhere between three to five hundred uh, they are still running all of the Redbird Express buses uh, in the normal environment that we would be if we were if if we had the 2500 ridership the same uh, four that are dedicated to us and so we're getting the same level of, of service that they you know, are committed to. It's just unfortunate when the, the ridership is there and the data is not able to be collected like it traditionally has been. And I guess the last question I have on this is, last time this contract came before us, we were told that there might be an issue with their board because their board needs to approve it as well. And I know everything is up for grabs and it's That's changed correct. because of the COVID situation. 
um, but the general manager that we were communicating is no, with is no longer there. Do we have any sort of feedback from Connect Transit about whether or not they're yes. wanting to move forward with this extension? Yes, matter of fact, we've been continuing to converse. We've got a good relationship with uh, uh, the current interim director and we continue from a partnership perspective and we reached out to them, they've reached out to us, and we were in both agreement. They're having to go to their board at their, the next available meeting, but they were, um, uh, they were cognizant of the 0% increase and we're in support of that, and they're continuing to be interested in getting a much more longer term contract, but wanted to delay that until the next uh, new uh, general manager was brought in. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or concerns regarding this resolution from the board? So we're not, I mean, we're just basically just want to keep going and for next semester, whether we, I mean, we don't know how many kids we have or anything, but just so we don't lose the, That's right. the whole That's thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman, uh, this is Trustee Donnie. May, may I ask one real quick question, please? Uh, yes, sir. So I would agree with, with Trustee Lauterbach. It's important that we, we have the, the service in place, and I apologize. I was a... I'm a, a little confused with what we're actually proposing to do. We're proposing to maintain the service in the contract as is until they get a new general manager and then we'll renegotiate a new contract. We have a contract that is it, traditionally, when I was here, we actually had entered into a two-year agreement uh, with the same mm -hmm. level of services, same certain number of buses, riding, uh, ridership hours, and things like that. Unfortunately, because of the past year or so with our contract negotiations, they were uh, the existing, excuse me, the director that just left was very much asking ISU to have uh, substantial increases that we could not support. And so our continued negotiations with them, unfortunately, reached a point where we had to have authorization, spending authorization, which is what, this, uh, what these resolutions uh, provide us for, to continue the service. And so, unfortunately, we, we keep doing six-month agreements thinking that we'll finally reach the, a situation where we can get a much more longer term. But right now, um, we're just asking for the resolution that allows us to continue uh, from January 1st through June 30th, and we're hoping by that time we'll, we'll be bringing back to you sometime next spring a resolution that actually provides a much more longer-term contract. No, but I, I get that, and thank you, Dan. I guess my question was more, and I should have probably been more specific, I'm sorry. Due to COVID and the numbers you expressed of uh, pre-COVID, we were carrying roughly 2,500 students, I thought you said, a day. And today they, they really don't know, which I get, they're proud of safety, they're boarding from the rear doors because they don't want the, 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 the students in the, in the operator interacting, but their best guess is we're somewhere between three to 500, which would tell me ridership is down like 80%. I would hope that somehow there would be, my term, a true up, some sort of, because if we're paying at, the level of 2,500 people riding a day, but only 500 are riding a day, we, we, we should somehow be discounted, I would guess, at some point in time for, for what we're actually, the amount of passengers versus what we're paying them. But, but I get the need, we need to, to make sure we have the service in place because this will be in our rear view mirror and hopefully um, it'll get back to somewhat of a normalcy. But, that's my only comment on it. I hope that made somewhat of sense to you. Uh, yes, sir, and actually I appreciate your points. This is really part of our uh, conversations we've been having when we've got a fixed rate for regardless of ridership um, because of the amount of time. And, um, and so we have been uh, talking with them about how to introduce some type of variable rate. And so that, uh, that is a part of the negotiations um, and we suspect that to continue. Um, and so it is a fluid, a fluid effort, but we're very much uh, appreciate the service they provide. And in a situation right now, we're definitely, unfortunately, giving a fixed rate, not able to maximize the services we're having to pay for. Madam Chairman, just to follow up on that, I know last time when we did it, they still had to take it to their board. Is, uh, will this be, I mean, do we have to wait to see if they'll accept it? Or are they gonna, do you, 
pretty sure they're going to accept it or deny yes. it or want more? Yeah. Or? Well, we pro we provide rather it's it, uh, it, traditionally it's become it, 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 the timing by which we have a board meeting, but so they're looking every every board every resolution we have is contingent upon theirs and theirs is contingent upon ours. But we, they should be having a meeting in, in the month, either October or November, to, to approve this. But, okay, but you think it's, I mean, because you've been having discussions and everything, so. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank it, you. Their, their board did a, or at least in conversations with their interim um, general manager, were in approval of the, of the no increase and the six-month extension. Any more questions, concerns regarding this, resident? Trustee Bone? Um, and last, last spring when we talked about the um, contract that they wanted, it, it was a substantial increase that we felt we could not support. That's correct. And so, you know, we're going to try and negotiate this spring again. So are you looking at um, other options if they are steadfast with that substantial increase that we realize we can't support? Yes. Okay, thank you. We continue you. to have that on a regular basis. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Resolution is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, the next resolution is resolution number 2020.10-31, COVID-19 uh, testing authorization. Before I go through this, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. John Bauer, who has our, become our testing czar. John uh, has been here for a long time as a terrific faculty member in the uh, chemistry department. And uh, after that, he went on to uh, head up all of our research activities. And he uh, has been willing to jump into the testing fray here. So as we move through this, and I describe what we would like to have you uh, consider this morning, uh, I'm going to put him on the spot to say if you have questions, uh, he probably knows the most of anybody in the room about that. So, John, that's a fair warning for you there. Um, <laughs> Illinois State University has made a significant financial commitment to help keep our students, faculty, and staff safe during the pandemic. An important component of our efforts to mm -hmm. limit the spread of coronavirus is a COVID-19 testing program. We've been talking with the University of Illinois about utilizing their SHIELD saliva-based test for COVID-19 since early summer. Progress continues to be made on an agreement between the University of Illinois and Illinois State in which Illinois State would serve as a regional laboratory to process saliva-based tests and would provide the saliva-based test to students, faculty, and staff. Discussions hit a snag when we recently learned that the saliva-based test had not been uh, approved by the Federal Drug Administration in conflict with information that had been shared previously. We've been assured by the University of Illinois uh, that they have initiated the process for an emergency use agreement and expect approval, we hope, in November, and they hope in November. Use of the saliva-based test will allow the university to test general numbers of, uh, or greater numbers, I should say, of students, faculty, and staff on a regular basis, provide faster turnaround time for results, and decrease per test costs from what we're paying now, which is basically $100 per test under the existing Redis's contract, to about $20 per test. The university anticipates conducting approximately 13,000 tests of students, faculty, and staff per week. Collection of samples will be completed at multiple on-campus locations. This resolution seeks authorization to execute a seven-month contract with a cost not to exceed $5.5 million for COVID-19 surveillance testing. This cost estimate provides for up to 275,000 tests being conducted over the contract period. We are requesting your approval to move forward with an agreement with the University of Illinois to establish the laboratory and purchase saliva-based tests to administer to Illinois State University faculty, staff, and students pending FDA issuance of an emergency use agreement for the uh, use of the saliva-based test. And with that, I would ask for your approval of this resolution. Thank you. Um, can I have a, do I have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2020-10-31, COVID-19 testing authorization? I so move. I have a motion by Trustee Navarro. Do we have a second? Second. Second, I'm sorry, who was the second? Second by Trustee Bone. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns from the board? 
Um, I have a couple questions, John. I was giving you the eye to kind of get you there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my first question as you're uh, making, it, making your way there is we have a contract with Redis. Um, and this may not be a question for you, actually, because this is contractual. How does that contract work? Are we able to just discontinue that contract and transition over to something else? Is there some penalty for cancellation of that contract? Or are we canceling it? Don't go too far, because I got some <laughs> for you, too. <laughs> I do not want to be the testing czar. Um, the, uh, actually, we, we wrote, when we wrote the Redditus agreement, like in any agreement, we, we agreed upon terms for a, an element of notice. And so if I'm remembering correctly, it's probably in the 30-day range. And there's not a, there's not a, a, you know, a substantial large minimum volume in that. And so I also have a feeling at the end of the day we'll enter into testing uh, with, through the UI Shield program and also be winding ourselves off the Redditus program and then um, it, it, probably doing things in parallel and then gradually, you know, decline because there is such a substantial difference uh, in, the, in, in the cost. One's being 100 and the UI uh, proposal right now is around $20 and may even go lower if there are some state subsidies that the, uh, that the governor's office is, is at least beginning to, uh, to offer comments on. Okay, then the second question is still a contractual question. So we, we, had, we heard Dr. Deed's comment that FDA uh, approval, even for emergency use, is still pending. Correct. So is it my assumption correct that we will not be entering until this contract, until they at least have the emergency approval? That is correct. Okay. And if there are any testing that we, uh, even if we start with minimal testing today, it will, those samples will actually have to travel to the UI Champagne lab because that is a, that is a certification uh, different that they can provide um, uh, for, for results, but there cannot be any results provided uh, by a lab that isn't certified. So that would be the only time where we would actually have the results um, uh, uh, reported through our program is once we get FDA approval. Um, I think this may be my last question. Um, is this a per test, and that this might be a joint, is this a per test um, basis that we're being charged for? Is it, um, it it's not a, um, a flat rate, so it, it's variable by how many tests Yes, it is, and, uh, and I have to, to uh, compliment the University of Illinois and the fiscal model that we're working with them and other uh, uh, universities across the state. It's a shared cost uh, model, and they are, uh, they're fronting all the equipment, they're fronting a major portion of the, of the personnel. We're providing, obviously, dedicated space in the lab. They're providing the equipment. We do hope at the end of the day that the, the equipment actually stays with us. It'll be some rather advanced equipment. Um, and so it really is a partnership, and, and we're, we're actually are looking forward to be associated with that partnership, but we actually hope it ends pretty quickly because we hopefully would have no need to do it anymore. Uh, but it is a, uh, it's something that we're very excited about getting involved in once they can get their approvals. I'm sorry, the attorney in the room was asking all of uh, contract questions. We may That's have okay. someone who has some science questions now. <laughs> Any other questions or concerns, comments from the board? Question. Trustee okay, so we, had, we approved three and a half million last time that came out of GRF. I know everything's coming out of GRF. I'm wondering when we're going to run out. I mean, I'm. We're not, we're not seeing that, that come down. How much money do we have left from the three and a half that we gave you last time? Approved, I should say. Did you check? Do you know how much? Maybe you can answer that. And I, I apologize, I hadn't checked up on where we stood. Yeah, so we have not yet done half of the test that was authorized in the Redditus contract, so we have I'm at sorry, least. sorry, I can't hear. Okay. So we have not yet um, done, I, I think we're about halfway through the number of tests that we were authorized by the Redditus contract. So whatever the authorization was, divide that by two. Well, but no, that it was just to, that we could do up to that. How much have we spent today? To date, I mean, so I assume we get a number. I'm just trying to think. There's about 100, about 12,000 tests, so $100 a test, so that's 1.2 million around that. So whatever is left over, then what's? I mean, hopefully we won't just try to use it all. So that goes to the five and a half million. Yes. Okay. What I would like to do is, that as we go along, because the we're going to, I mean, the end of November, then hopefully we'll, we're closed until the middle of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Julie, yeah. We're closed until the middle of January. So we have two months in which to get 
I mean, the FDA didn't approve them last time. I'm not sure if they're going to, uh, what's going to happen this time since a lot of it's not going through. Um, how are we going to deal with testing when school starts in January? So we plan to have the, the shield method in place at, at the beginning, well, by the end of this semester, probably, probably uh, late November or December. And so when students come back in uh, early January, we'll have the ability to, to essentially do large-scale testing of, of anybody that I comes. I guess I have a real problem that we're going to let students come back without being already negative. I mean, I think we had a problem with that, and that's when I think this, the township gets a little uptight because students come back from vacation. Uh, I'm a, do we not have a health app in which they already know that they can put in as, if they are negative or positive on there? Isn't there, don't we have, uh, people have to come in and get tested every so often, both off campus and on campus? So we, we, ha we do have a program of testing and, and students that test, um, they, they can upload their test results into the student health service portal. Um, so the problem with, with actually requiring that at the beginning of the, the spring semester is that uh, classes start January 10, 11th, I think. Right. And so students will start coming back that, that week before that. And so um, having a test, having to show a test that you've already tested before you come back to campus, I'm sorry, my mask keeps slipping down. Um, uh, basically, re remember a test is a point in time, right? No, so, I know, but I mean, other universities are doing it where you cannot move into a dorm until you've tested negative. You can't go into a classroom until you've, you know, unless you've tested negative, just. Um, yeah, um, so I think that that's called entry testing, right? So where, where you can actually, you test before you come in to the uh, to the university, so that gives you some some sense of security that you, that people are negative, but it's no guarantee that people are negative, because it's a point of in time that's that um, you know if I test on Monday, I don't right. Get my and results. I'm not arguing that, but to me, for our our own sanity and on you know to uh, kind of assist with the townspeople when all these kids come students come back, I would think we would want to at least have them at that point be negative. So. So, that doesn't mean, I mean, we all know that, you know, we don't really know when it's going to happen or who's going to get it or what, but um, right. I, that's always been a worry to me as to why we don't have them at least test once before they come back, the week before they come back, and that that to get sent to the portal. So, so my preference would be to do rap, uh, frequent testing once they get on campus because um, what can happen, and I think this happened at another university in town, is that they, that did require entry testing you come back and you, everybody thinks that they're safe and that they're negative and so the behavior... So before, so the day the students come back, then we're going to test them before they go to the dorms and the school we have, classes? We have that ability to do that. We're going to do that. Uh, is that's that what not, I'm hearing? That's not my decision, so, but we have well, the ability Well, that's, that's what I'm hearing is that we want to do it. We don't, we don't trust others to do it. We want to be able to do it when they get here. I think it's very difficult to, very difficult to require that because there's really no teeth in the requirement. Um, and other institutions in the state really are not doing what you're suggesting. There are very few of them that are actually well, doing Well, there are other that. around the country they are. Around the country, but right. not in the state of Illinois. Right. I, I, I understand your point. That's, I mean, that, that's kind of where, you know, as we're, we're going down the line, it just yeah. kind of bothers me that you know, we had trouble with, you know, the NRA in the beginning with that. Um, so I think that's something that we really need to look at, that somehow there is a way others are doing it, maybe not in Illinois, but We've always been ahead of everybody else in Illinois, so we don't, have to, <laughs> we don't have to go behind Appreciate them. that comment, yeah. So. So. We're, we're continuing to have discussions about that. Matter of fact, we talked about that just on Wednesday uh, with the, in the cabinet meeting, so points well taken. Thank I mean, because to me, every time we come back, we, we're going to try another way to, to try to get more money to do the COVID testing. Um, and at some point, you know, hopefully this will be over. I don't know that it will for a while. Um, but. I think to me that would make the most sense to be able to, at least if we're going to test them before they move in, that's fine. But uh, I think we need to, for the town of Normal, I know that you know, Bloomington and Normal are very nervous when we came back in the spring or in the fall. And I don't want to see that happen again since we have good relations. So I think we need to look at that a little bit more. Okay. Thank you. you. I have a question. Trustee, okay. Trustee Bone, please proceed. Uh, can you tell me what the sensitivity and specificity of the test from U of I, the shield test, is compared to the Redditus test? Uh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, so we're told that the, um, 
both tests have this, have similar sensitivity. They both require, I think it's 37 CT uh, cycles to, to turn positive. So the, um, the, the scientific method is, is essentially the same, whether the virus is expressed the same in the saliva versus the nasal um, mm -hmm. sample is, um, I'm not familiar with the diff with if that's been studied um, or is really well known uh, if there's a substantial difference. And how much saliva is, requ is required for that test? So they're saying now it's about a milliliter. A milliliter? milliliter. So, yeah, okay. milliliter, a little bit less. They're using smaller tubes now than they did when they started. Okay. And I know at U of I, um, they do test the students, I think, twice a week or something like that, and then they have an app on their phone to get into a building. Are you anticipating doing something like that or not? Uh, so that's still under dis discussion. So the, okay. the way to, um, to communicate the results back to the students and then also to what, what consequences there will be for uh, testing or not testing, that's still under discussion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Julie? Uh, Proceed, Bob. Yeah, uh, Dr. Bauer, um, on a more positive note and thinking ahead maybe, let's assume this virus does diminish and we're on the downside and a vaccine comes out in the next two or three months. So is, is a vaccine uh, process going to be uh, maybe implemented on campus or something or provided? And again, is that going to come up for another cost increase in that or uh, anything, any thought there or any projections? Uh, I do know there has been planning about distribution of a virus, and that's been in c conjunction with the McLean County Health Department. I, I'm not party to those details, so I, I'm not exactly sure what, what uh, where those are uh, discussions are right now. But the, the, even with the virus, the testing will be required for a while yet, um, as the the vir or as uh, sorry, even with a vaccine, testing will be required for a while as as people build their immunity and the virus is dis sorry, vaccine is distributed. Um, so uh, we anticipate the need for the, the testing even even after the a vaccine is, is available. Okay, thank you. How, how soon after we, if we approve this resolution today and they do receive FHA issuance of the emergency use agreement, how soon would we be able to get our uh, lab and our testing up and running here on ISU's campus? So because of the delay in the uh, authorization and the, uh, when we found out that that actually wasn't authorized, we we uh, we kind of stood down for a while, and so it will still take another four to six weeks to get the lab up and running. Um, we because we have to hire people and and get all the equipment in place. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor of approval of the resolution signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, resolution is uh, somewhat related uh, about quarantine, but uh, it's resolution number 2020.10-32, COVID-19 quarantine authorization. The university uh, has dedicated 5% of the rooms within the residence halls and university apartments to serve as isolation spaces for residents You've tested positive for the COVID-19 virus and quarantine spaces for residents deemed close contacts of persons who've tested positive for COVID-19 virus. During the spike in COVID-19 cases on campus and at a time when the CDC changed its recommendation to indicate that students testing positive should not be sent home, the university became concerned that would not have sufficient spaces on campus to house students who were under quarantine. The university contacted uh, local hotels to determine whether they would consider housing students in quarantine. Two local hotels indicate, uh, indicated their interest in providing housing and meals for our students in quarantine, and we signed a limited agreement with one of these hotels for the fall semester and have utilized it uh, somewhat uh, during these times when on-campus spaces were not readily available. This resolution seeks authorization to execute a contract for rooms and meals for up to 94 rooms for a period of 10 weeks in the fall of 2020 and the time frame September 15, 2020 to December 1, 2020 and for 16 weeks in, in the spring of 2021, a period of time January 11, 2021 through May 14, 2021 
at a cost not to exceed $1.6 million. The exact number of re rooms used each night will vary based, obviously, on the need for quarantine spaces on any particular given day. It is our hope that we will not need to use these hotel rooms moving forward, but we want to be prepared about the immediate, uh, should the immediate need occur. And I ask for your approval of this resolution. Do I have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2020-10-32, quarantine authorization? I so move. We have a motion by Trustee Navarro. Do I have a second? Second. Is that Trustee second. Lauderback? I have a second by Trustee Lauderback. Are there any questions, comments, concerns from the board? Yes. Okay, I think we have quite a few. Uh, we're going to start here with uh, Trustee Turner. I have a couple, actually. Um, so is this only for on-campus students, or is it for just any student who gets tested and it's negative? I mean, it's positive. I think I'll turn to uh, Vice President Stevens. Uh, it, is, it is currently for on-campus students. Because we've got to, uh, again, make sure we de-densify those in, the, in our existing housing environment. And then so will it just be so um, when they, so is this the, um, the okay, sorry. <laughs> is this a for, like a first come first serve thing? So when the housing fills up, the 5% housing fills up, then we're going to start using the hotels? Is that how it's going to go? It's a combination. It really depends on the certain situations. Uh, 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 some students may want to. We're being very flexible and very respectful of not only the student but well as the parents. And and so if if we've got place in housing, it's obviously easier for us to have that environment. But if uh, if if we feel the need to seek those extra spaces, this is a resolution designed to have it in case we have to have a spike. We, we have not fortunately had to use very many of these, but because of our, our contractual authority is limited up to a certain amount, we're really planning for hopefully a situation we really won't have to use a lot of. Okay. And, and um, are students going to be required to stay the full 14 days, or is there going to be like a check-in period to test them again to see if they're going to have to stay the full 14 or not? Uh, from my understanding, it is a it is a it is a quarantine period uh, working through student uh, student affairs, and being monitored uh, 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 through that environment. And so they're not allowed to, to leave. Once you're in that type of uh, environment, you're supposed to stay quarantined for the period of time that the CDC is guiding us and the health department's guiding us. Yeah. You really really can't test out of the quarantine time frame. It's a full 14 days for the full quarantine. So can't go back and get another test and expect to right. limit that time frame. I guess to piggyback on what Trustee Turner was saying, is someone able to walk us through? A student shows up, they get tested, they're positive. L explain that to us, how that works. I'm, I live in a residence hall, or in Jada's, uh, I'm sorry, Trustee Turner's example, I don't live in a residence hall. What is the track that the students go through when they test positive? Vice President Johnson is uh, <coughs> closest to that issue, so lead okay. us through that if you would. All right, I'll attempt to go through that. So if you're living in a residence hall and you test positive, all right, health services get that notification, all right, then health services then notifies then our housing staff of that information. That student is then informed as well, okay, and we make arrangements then for that student then to be placed, if they test positive, in an isolation space. Typically that's on campus. There is then contract tracing that takes place, all right, so then if the students, if there are students who have not tested positive, but we believe that through contact tracing that it warrants them to go into quarantine, then the first step is if they want to go home, that's fine as well. But uh, we want them and prefer for them to like be here. And if that's the case, then we have space on campus. But every now and then you might have someone who maybe they don't want to be seen on campus and things of that nature. We can leverage them those spaces in the hotel to say, we can place you in one of the hotels then in that sense, okay? So then we provide the transportation. We have case managers who work with these students, whether they're on campus or off campus. We check, on, check with them on a daily basis. We provide meals for them if they're on campus then uh, a couple of times a day, all right? So we bring those meals to those students. With these uh, hotels that we contract with, we provide meals there as well, all right? And our um, case managers actually go out and actually they can stay there as well to be with those students. Those students also have 
got our case managers' phone numbers and things of that nature, so we really take care of them in that sense. For off-campus students, if they do test positive, again, health services then contacts those uh, individuals, and for the most part, those students then quarantine or they isolate and quarantine off-campus at their residence, okay? We do the same contact tracing and so forth and go through the same procedures if there are students who live off campus and on campus then that we're in contact with those folks as far as providing spaces for those folks. Does that make sense? Okay. Any additional questions on the process? Trustee Navarro, did you have, uh, I'm sorry, Trustee Turner, were you done with your question? I have one more question. <laughs> it was more for like a safety concern. Um, so with the hotels we still operating, that the houses that we're going to use, are they going to still be operating, allowing other guests to check in, or how is that going to be separate from like the COVID students and then the people that will be at the hotel? I'm not sure I'm following that. So, so like, state that again. We're going to be at a hotel. Okay. And hotels usually have guests that check in. Is this so hotel only going to be just strictly for the COVID students, and they're not going to be allowing other guests, outside guests, to come in? Now, the, that's a great question. Um, these spaces that we would then be contracting for are like on a particular floor, and they're only for us. Okay. okay? And those students then are expected to stay in those spaces and not leave their rooms. Okay. So that's how we work that, and we provide meals for them at their room and things of that nature. Okay. okay? So they're separate from then uh, any hotel guests and things of that nature. They won't have contact with those folks. Okay. Matter of also, fact, when they come there, there's like a welcome little basket and information and instructions and things of that nature. I would also mention that those would only be students who are quarantined. Correct. Only quarantined. Not isolation or people who have tested positive. Right. We do not use those spaces off campus for those hotels for that. Okay. So my question was about the contract, and um, I'm assuming that it's based, um, that the fees are based on services that are actually contracted for, or is there a minimum amount that's going back to the hotels each month, quarter? We're in the conversations we've had in the, in the first few months when we were in the month of September when we, we were able to work in the community to, to find a few hotels that would, that would work with us. Um, we're, we're taking them blocks. Um, we and right now we had an agreement in September that gave us a certain number of beds because they're locking them out they're essentially dedicating a floor and 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 so they gave us a very reasonable rates to do that as as uh, Vice President Johnson said we also worked through the scenario of food now food is not charged to us if if there's not there but a room is charged now with the fact we've got less uh, need going on we're, uh, each month we're going to be looking at how much do we want to commit to. And so again, our resolution is really designed for it not to exceed and we're going to do our best uh, to try to manage through that, giving based on the, the sensitivity of how testing and situations are occurring um, and to try to minimize whatever we agree to commit to. So the hotels did receive a minimum amount, whether you had students in That's those exactly rooms or not. That's exactly right, because they, were, they could not rent that room to anyone else. Were those hotels that we used also being used by other institutions? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. How long was the block? So if we had to have a block of rooms, is it for this whole 10 weeks? Is it for the whole 16 no. weeks? Or how long, how do we assess that block? Thank you for asking that. Actually, what we've been doing is, is when we initially quickly a place this together was a 30 days and we entered into to basically through a, a period of time in September to early October and we've got an agreement in October right now and we'll be looking at what do we think we want to do in November what do we think we want to do in December we certainly given the especially after Thanksgiving we will be certainly dialing that back and but also be very much prepared for the January environment as as uh, trustee Letterback was talking about earlier so we're going to be managing that in the the partnership agreements we've got within the, the, the hotel managements are being very uh, flexible and very supportive of, of, of this uh, situation with us. Trustee Navarro, do you have any other? That's it. No. Anyone this side? All right, Trustee Loudermack. Okay, so we have 60% of the dorms are full, correct? Uh, we're around 50% now. Okay, and we don't, so are all the dorms open? They are. What about 
quarantining, I mean, and we're only going to use 5% dorm space quarantine, and we're going to go out and pay? Again, we are preparing for, we're going to do a lot more testing of our student population, okay? Who knows where this virus is going to go, all right? Could spike, is spiking across the country and things of that nature. So again, as the resolution uh, says, it's for surge space. If we so get back into we, a situation how where- How many have we put in uh, the uh, hotels so far? Uh, I would say uh, if a dozen, a couple dozen, um, so probably max at this point. In right? all the extra dorm space, we don't have room to put more than 5%. My so understanding is that uh, in the hotels, uh, we put 35 at this point. I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if we're only 50% full in the dorms, we don't have an empty floor somewhere that you know, a bunch of floors that we could put students or, um. Well, again, right now, uh, those numbers have fluctuated in the past. I know the numbers right now seem like, again, that we have. No, I, I understand that, but you've had 35, and I guess I'm trying to understand, you know, the 35, or I don't, you didn't have 35 at once, I'm sure. But, so how are they spaced within the dormitories? that we don't have, an, that we can't, you know, have a floor or something here that's... Okay, that's a good question. Right now, that's a great question. Right now, we're utilizing and leveraging all of the residence halls then, okay? So we're using, utilizing all of the residence halls. It's particularly difficult, though, as it relates to um, a Waterson, a Tri Towers, and so forth, where you have um, universal restrooms, okay? So our preference is, and what we've leveraged mostly, is um, Cardinal Court because you have more of apartment style facilities and, and single restrooms then in that sense. So that's why this particular type of space, hotel spaces are more attractive because of the restroom situation. We can't leverage Watterson, Tri Towers, and Hewitt Manchester in that same type of manner. But if they're quarantining and not to go out, and I mean in, in uh, Watterson, what, we just have a few people in all of the uh, suites or? Yeah, but then, then you expose people to like the, the um, you got people um, traversing hallways and things of that nature and so forth. So you can't do that within those type of facilities at all. I, I would also uh, add another uh, fact that I've just received here this morning, that uh, as of August the 17th, we've had 233 total students in on-campus quarantine and isolation uh, since the uh, beginning of the year. And obviously, because of the quarantine, those have to be individual rooms. Right. So you've got 233 right. rooms that potentially were impacted during that time frame. So what we're, what we're doing with this resolution, frankly, is again kind of planning for the worst right. and hoping for the best so we don't spend the amount of money that uh, is here. But if we need it, we've got it. I think that's, so that's the precaution. Right. And I think I just I, I want to make sure that I'm understanding because I think I do. So part of the reason why the residence hall, whatever percentage they're at, it's not because they're just empty rooms around. It's because those might have been two people rooms and now they're one person room because it's social distancing or they may have had three people in it. So it's not just an empty room right. that's, that's Correct. available. Correct. It's, that's why the percentage is low. So it's not that rooms are available at the percentage low. Correct. They can't have anybody else Correct. there. Correct. And, it, and then the second thing I thought I heard um, Dan say is that while the preference may be for us to have them on campus, we do have to have some flexibility and sensitivity to where they want to be. Because Correct. they may not want to be on campus and be in an isolation situation because there may be, who knows, there may be a, some, some sort of stigma they feel associated with that or whatever. And they may want to be in a hostel environment. And so I think that's another reason maybe why we're trying to make this available to them because it's already a difficult situation for them, and we certainly want to be as sensitive as we can to accommodating their wishes for where they would be housed. Correct. We're trying to be as sensitive as we possibly can. Again, that's why we have case managers working with these students, okay? And there are all types of complex issues that these students are, are working with, in addition to trying to do their classes, okay? So, so we're definitely trying to be uh, sensitive to them and their family situations. We've had families who have contacted us and said, no, they can't come home, of course, because their family's going through a certain situation as well. You know, whether it's employment matters where they've tested positive within their own environment. So, the, you know, that student can't come home then as well. So, very complex situations. Thank you. Any further questions, concerns from the board? Thank you. Um, 
All those in favor, please signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you very much. Boy, won't be, it be a great day when the word quarantine and COVID-19 <laughs> and virus are in the rear view mirrors, uh, Trustee uh, Donahue mentioned. Um, we're now uh, moving into uh, other resolutions that have nothing to do with COVID-19, <laughs> so this is really terrific. Next resolution is resolution number 2020.10-33, authorization to name a classroom. As authorized by the Board of Trustees Governing Document Section C, Policy Subsection uh, 4C, Naming of Facilities, the Board of Trustees shall approve the naming of all facilities at the university. And I bring you today a request to name a classroom at the Illinois State University Farm, the Compere Financial Classroom. Compere Financial has committed a cash gift to support a total renovation of the classroom and bring the entire facility within federal compliance of accessibility laws. This includes adding a wheelchair ramp on the building, renovating the uh, restrooms to increase capacity and add provisions for accessibility, and also to uh, raise the floor in the classroom to a single level. Indeed, all of that's been completed. I was up there, as I mentioned, this, uh, uh, this past week, and uh, that's all been completed. The gift uh, displays considerable generosity of Compere Financial and is a demonstration of the company's commitment and partnership, not only with the Department of Agriculture at Illinois State University, but also to the excellence of our students and the belief in building a stronger agricultural industry through them. And I ask for your approval of this resolution to name the classroom at the Illinois State University Farm, the Compere Financial Classroom. Do I have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2020-10-33, Authorization to name classroom. So moved. I have a motion by Trustee Bone. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a second by Trustee Navarro. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns before we go to the vote? Looks great. Comment? That was great. <laughs> no, I was out there on yeah. Monday. That okay. Good. Um, all those in favor, uh, signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? The resolution is approved. Thank you very much, and again, great thanks to uh, Compere uh, Financial for their investment. That Civic Engagement Center is still hanging out there in case <laughs> folks have had soaking that in right now. Uh, next resolution is resolution number 2020.10-34, authorization to name an office. Stan and Renee Shingles have committed a cash gift to support renovation and upgrades for room 140 in the Multicultural Center, and we are asking your support to name this space in their honor. Stan Shingled earned a bachelor's degree in 1982 and a master's in 1988 from Illinois State University. He currently serves as the Interim Chief Diversity Officer at Central Michigan University and has served in several administrator roles during a 30-year career at the university. Stan has remained active with his alma mater, currently serving on the board of directors for the Illinois State University Black Colleagues Association and as a member of the Illinois State University Alumni Association Board of Directors. In 2012, Stan was inducted into Illinois State University's College of Applied Sciences and Technology Hall of Fame. In 2019, Stan was inducted into the Division of Student Affairs Stephen Sandy Adams Legacy Hall of Fame. Equally as talented and recognized for her achievements, Dr. Renee Shingles earned a master's degree from Illinois State University in 86 and currently serves as a professor and program director for the School of Rehabilitation and Medical Sciences at Central Michigan University. A pace setter, Dr. Shingles became the 13th black woman in the United States to become a certified athletic trainer in 1987 and was the first black woman to be inducted into the National Athletic Trainers Hall of Fame. She also served as a trainer for the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia. In 2017, Dr. Shingles was inducted into the Illinois State University College of Applied Sciences and Technology Hall of Fame. I ask for your approval for this resolution to name Room 40 in the Multicultural Center and honor these two talented and proud Redbirds. And I would also, on a personal note, mention that I also know that many of you on this board know Stan and Renee, as uh, uh, do I and as uh, Dr. Johnson and many others from a long career in former career of mine in student affairs, and uh, what a great couple, what dedicated alums, and what an honor to 
uh, ask for your approval of this resolution. I, um, do I have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2020-1034, authorization to name office? So moved. Second. I have a motion by Trustee Louderback and a second by Trustee Turner. Do we have any questions, comments, concerns? Um, I would echo what Dr. Deet says. I am very well acquainted with uh, both Stan and Renee, and they are very, very proud Redbirds, big supporters of our campus. They are very um, well respected in their, both in their career endeavors and just great people. So um, thank you to them for this generous gift. Um, once we approve this resolution, I hope we approve taking people's money still around here. <laughs> so um, thank you. Um, for all those in favor, please signify by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. The resolution is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson Jones, that concludes the resolutions for today. I would now entertain a motion to move into executive session. I'm just going to ask because of this environment and because we probably need to get out and get some fresh air, stretch our legs, take care of some things, that we resume executive session at 1130 um, to give the trustees a chance to kind of get settled in. So. I move, I would like to now entertain a motion to move into executive session at 1130 for the purpose of considering the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees pursuant to 5 ILCS section 120-2C1, collective negotiating matters between the university and its employees, 5 ILCS section 120-2C2, Litigation which has been filed and is pending before a court or an administrative tribunal or is probable or imminent as allowed in 5 ILCS section 122 C 11 and the purchase or lease of real property as allowed in 5 ILCS section 120 2 C 5. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Motion by Trustee Louderback. Do I have a second? I'll second. second. Uh, all those in favor signify by aye. 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 Uh, the motion passes. We will now take a brief recess and resume for executive session in the old main room. Is that correct? Uh, at 1130. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming out this morning. Everybody have a great weekend. Oh, I'm sorry. When we move from executive session, following the executive session, the board will move back into public session solely for the purpose of adjournment. You are welcome to come back to join us to adjourn if you would like, but you may want to do something else with your Friday afternoon. With that, we conclude the quarterly meeting of the Board of Trustees. Thank you, Thank you all for coming out this morning. <laughs>